Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Faris. How are you today? Hi, Michael. I'm really good, thanks, and great to be on uh, this podcast. Thank you for coming on the podcast, and thank you for being so patient, because I know you booked our interview back in January this year, and it's we're now in June, listeners. <laughs> we're now in June, which is great, and thank you for being so patient. Um, I'm very interested to hear your story, uh, very interested to hear about your business, and uh, the background about the name and everything. I won't say what it is yet until yeah. later. Um, but let's start with like a really open question. And the open question is, tell us about your story and how did you get to where you are today? That is a great question. It reminds me actually of a you know very similar question I ask people when I interviewed, I used to interview them for companies. Uh, would just say, you know, tell me how you got here today. And it's, it, not only do you learn so much, but you see how they tell the story. And I'm sure your people you've had on your show have told their stories in countless ways. And do you know mm. what? The joy, the joy of booking in January, but not doing this till June, it means I've got six months more of stories to tell you. Uh, yeah, true. <laughs> that's true, right? So, yeah. Um, so brilliant. So um, look, yeah, my story is both um, very similar and very different to everyone else's. Everyone out there has a unique story. Uh, I think yes. my story, if we go right back to the beginning, but I'll give a really pricey, grew up in South London, um, to a uh, my parents who are Palestinian immigrants uh, to the UK and so there was a strong Arabic culture strong Palestinian culture and I've got ties back to Palestine we'll, we'll touch upon those in, in my story and went to school in South London uh, let's pick it up after school you know I studied the sciences I studied a bit of maths after yeah. school I decided I needed a bit of variety and I went completely random and spent a year living in a village in Nepal uh, where I did development work and taught English. And that was wow. really, really a formative year for me at the age of 17 uh, to That's have a different culture. And I can tell you a lot of stories from that time. But then it was back to university. I did a maths and economics degree. And I guess partly inspired by the um, experience of having worked in Nepal, uh, but also it was the dot-com burst. Um, there weren't a lot of graduate jobs. So I came up with a radical idea of going and becoming a teacher in Latin America. And I moved to El Salvador, where I taught at the British School of El Salvador, maths and economics for several years, uh, and then came back to the UK and continued teaching and um, became a bit disillusioned with it. You know, it wasn't quite the same in a British school where all I was doing was taking knives off kids and and dealing with uh, a lot of um, a lot of difficulties. It was, it was more right. kind of there were more challenges then. Um, and I began to think about uh, pivoting my career and moving into the corporate world. Right. Um, and uh, I could only do that through graduate schemes. So actually, uh, I reinvented I reinvented myself and joined a graduate scheme, which was to be for an energy company. So I ended up joining a, a big energy company here in the UK. In the meantime, I had time to kill because graduate schemes don't start. Um, they only start once a year. So yes. I took myself off to Palestine for a year where I taught in a university and worked in a university um, in the West Bank. Wow. Um, and, but then I was in the corporate world. I learned all about the energy, uh, everything to do about how we uh, create energy, you know, um, mm -hmm. electricity, gas, uh, to how we sell it to people. And I learned everything about business in a space of four years because I was in the strategy team of this. Energy. Right. And after four years there, I got approached to join consulting which would take up the next 12 years of my life working for big consulting firms. Michael, the likes uh, some of your listeners will have heard of EY, Carney, uh, a few others. And I reached a point where I enjoyed the work, but um, was a little bit uh, disillusioned where I was. And it gave me enough impetus to start my own company, which is around right. consulting. And that was two and a half years ago, Michael. Not that long ago then. Not that long ago. But... No, fascinating. Okay, so just there's a lot that comes up into my head and I, I've, there's a few questions I've got yeah. for you. This thing you did at 17 in Nepal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where, where did that come from? What inspired you to go and do that at the age of 17? You, you weren't even an adult. 
I officially. Wasn't, I wasn't officially an adult. Um, and uh, what inspired me is I, it was largely, the biggest driving factor was a friend's sister who had done a similar scheme a few years before and she had raved about it and not just the experience, but what, all she had got out of it. And and really got me thinking, uh, funny enough, that friend, he did it, uh, he did the same scheme. And so the two of us were very close and we, um, we grew really emboldened by this idea uh, that we would get so much out of it, having spent, uh, the two of us spent 10 years in the same school and we right. found, um, we'd had a great education, but it had all been very spoon fed. And uh, yes. we were, as you say, um, you, you, I don't think I had the self-awareness to realize that I wasn't really an adult. Um, but I was conscious that I'd only had a, a very sliver of a um, exposure to the world. So this seemed like a perfect way to do it in a fairly safe environment because it was run by an organization. And look, my friend was doing it. So it made a bit of an easier sell to my parents who were initially quite resistant to the idea. Uh, yeah. And to be honest, I didn't fully appreciate what the year would involve. No. Uh, but I am immensely grateful that I did it. And it's still to this day, probably the best year of my life. And what did it involve? Well, on a, on a practical level, what it involved was two months of training. They taught us how to be teachers, how to teach English as a foreign language. Right. And they also taught us how to do development work. So still to this day, I know how to build a pit latrine for a family of 10 that will last 10 years. So that's, uh, and we also learned skills like how to make stoves out of mud, how to build vegetable gardens, because they were sending us into quite rural villages to not only educate in English, but also to raise the standards of living and development. Right. Um, so after two months training, we were then sent in pairs to our villages where we would spend the next sort of nine months working with building, you know, uh, working with the community, building relationships and doing those twin tracks of work um, uh, sporadically coming back to Kathmandu, the capital. Um, but that was effectively our remit and where we spent most of our time. Incredible. Because is, is, is it quite high up in the mountains, Nepal? So Nepal's a fascinating country. Uh, it mm. is. It's got eight of the ten highest peaks in the world. Um, yeah. But it's also got a, a a basin, a terai, right, which is right. under under sea level. So it goes from minus like uh, two hundred meters to Everest, which is. Mm. Uh, so it's it's actually got like jungle. It's got mountains, but the, predominantly it is mountainous. And we were living at about three thousand meters. So right. Put that in context. That's well above anything in the UK. Um, I could see Everest every day. I mean, uh, just how amazing is that to every morning of my life for a year to see Mount Everest and um, uh, and uh, and to live at that altitude. And did, did this kind of adventure bug, because, I mean, you've got to have a, a desire for some adventure. Did that come from your parents at all? Were they adventurous? I think they were, well, they definitely were adventurous. I mean, um, you know, they uh, both emigrated from Palestine, um, yes. you know, um, uh, but uh, several times over their lives, you know. So my right. dad's first adventure was in his teens when he, he moved to do a, to study in the States. You know, he won a scholarship. So very, you know, in, uh, in, a, in a young age, he had to, a spirit of adventure um, for different reasons. But certainly I looked at the amazing things that both my parents had achieved and it, it gave me confidence uh, that years later to, to, to also try stuff for myself. Yeah, that I, I, it explains it a little bit. I mean, obviously there's your own you know, desire to do things, but if you've seen stuff being done by your family members, it might not be your mum and dad, it might be an uncle or an aunt or a brother or sister, but it does give you that little bit of courage to kind of go, well, they managed it. So why can't I manage it type of thing? And uh, OK, that, that and, and obviously that kind of sense of adventure carried you on to your other, let's call them missions <laughs> yeah. that you did as well. Yeah, so definitely. After you did, yeah. I mean, definitely. Once, once you've had one adventure, it certainly primes you for the next. Um, yeah. And it makes you less afraid. Uh, but you know what? Um, comfort uh, is these things, um, rightly so, wrap around you. So if I look at the 
it depends how you define an adventure. But if I look at that, that kind of big Nepal type adventure, I'm obviously doing less of those nowadays. But yeah, hey, starting my own business is an adventure. Um, learning any new skill for anyone out there is an adventure. Even moving house is an adventure. You know, you can make an adventure out of anything. It doesn't have to be grandiose. So would you say you're somebody who likes change? I, I'm like every other human being. I probably resist change initially, but I think I adopt to it, adapt to it quicker than others. And in fact, it's a large part of what I do as a work to help organizations get through change quicker and make right. it more. So um, I can do that for organizations if I didn't keep applying change to myself. Um, so I'll give you a good example, Michael. A few years yeah. ago, I, I, I used to own a, my own property. I used to own my own flat and I sold it and there was... It was a long, arduous process to sell my flat. And when I mm. did finally sell it, I came up with this plan. I was going to stay in London, but I thought, Do you know what? I'm a renter now. Why not embrace this as an adventure and live in different random parts of London that I've never lived in? Because right. most of us just stick to one part, you know, it doesn't matter or wherever, you know, and often it's not far from where you grew up. Now, I thought, hey, I live in an amazing city where people pay thousands of pounds to come and visit as a tourist why should i you know why not embrace that so i came yeah. up with a plan to live in four different places i'd never lived and just got going with it you know i i didn't care that it was the hassle i had to box up every year i had to had to move i saw it as what a great chance to experience different communities meet a whole bunch of new people um and and plus it was research for when i was next ready to buy it totally explains everything about you because the fact that you moved around when you were a youngster, that your parents moved around when they were young, and now you're doing it in adult life, <laughs> you definitely embrace change. So much so that you seek it out by saying, I'm going to move in different locations. <laughs> That's seeking out change because it's a hassle moving house, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, providing you're a minimalist, and I'm an uh, uh, aspiring minimalist, let's put it that way, uh, nowhere near to it yet. But I would love to be able to just pack up and go, I'm going to live somewhere else. I've only got like three boxes to take with me, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I am definitely not a minimalist, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But that, that does explain. And what amazing thing that you're helping people with change in companies. Yeah, I mean, uh, change is a fundamental part of life, is, is definitely a large part of business. Uh, and mm. it, it can be the difference between successful businesses and unsuccessful businesses. So it's a great uh, privilege to be able to help. Um, and actually, you know, I don't specifically uh, only focus on change. I focus on getting teams working better together, uh, yeah. getting people to buy into ideas. Now, obviously, change is a large subset of that. Um, but mm. really, it could apply to anything uh, where there is a difference of views, teams are not aligned, companies are not aligned. That's really my forte where I come in and, and help uh, and me and my company do. Um, people in organizations yeah. resist change. There's no yes. doubt about it. And that's where you get friction. Relationships inside companies is always difficult. You know, people don't gel, they don't get on with each other, or they don't like the look of somebody or somebody rubs them up the wrong way. And that whole dynamic is a very difficult environment sometimes for people to work in, operate in. Then on top of that, you have the pandemic as well. <laughs> you know, homeworking, people working from home, not getting the kind of treatment that they would like, being ignored. There's so many things that go on. So why don't you tell us a little bit if, you know, if you were going into a company, they they learned about you, maybe through this podcast, let's hope, and you're going to pitch to them because they can see they need to perform better than where they are. Yeah. How would that go? What would your pitch look like? What is it that you would share with them? Uh, so, well, first of all, the fact that they've they, they've reached out to me and invited me is a massive bonus because that shows a level of self-awareness that they do have some challenges they could do with some help. Yeah. Uh, and that should not be underestimated, you know, because a lot of a lot of companies that do not have that and a lot of senior people don't have that awareness. Um, and basically what I'd say is um, my pitch would be what 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 what's your problem? What's holding you back? Where do you want to be? 
um, and why do you think you're not achieving that? Now, um, invariably, it'll be one of the things you've listed, people disagreeing, people being too busy, people not understanding, and say, okay, well, are you, are you communicating to them in the way they like to be communicated? Mm. Are you, instead of assuming that, look, I'm just going to say this and everyone, it, they either like it or lump it, right? They, they, they listen to it and they buy into it. Are, or are you going, actually, maybe they didn't understand what I said. Maybe I need to say it in a different way. Yeah. Um, because if you haven't tried that, if you haven't adopted that latter approach, you're far less likely to be successful um, than, uh, than if you had. Okay. Because um, we all breeze through life um usually operating in the same way and this is why i like change um but actually that's not always the most effective way because we'll always meet people who resist like you said resistance to change is very common and it reminds me very much of my very first day in consulting when i joined this consulting firm and a very senior person gave me a slide gave me a, a, a document that had written on it 28 ways people say no without saying no yeah all right and it's a great slide i still use it today and it's, it's all the things you'll hear in any conversation like, oh, that sounds great, but that won't work here. Or, oh, well, we've already tried that once. So, no, we're not going to try it. Or, you know, oh, yeah, that's just too expensive. So, really. Oh, I have, I have another one for you. But we're not really like anybody else. We're not really like anybody else. Of course not. <laughs> right. And every we're culture, unique. <laughs> we're unique. Every culture may add ones on for their culture. But fundamentally, it's based. So, you know, um, how do you how do you get people to not look at things that way you know not from yes. a cost not from a unique lens not from a um that you've got to adapt not expect them to 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 do the the equation in their head and go oh i get it now um so that would be my pitch like how many of those you you too many a lot of people focus on their broadcast ability they don't focus on is it being received right so i can help you with the Will it be received part? Mm. And I can I can teach you how to broadcast in different ways so that it's more likely to be received. Um, and that's what I can add. And I can add it in a variety of ways. It can be around change. It can be around alignment. It can be around anything from strategy to problem solving. Um, and I will bring techniques and me and my team will bring techniques that make it fun, engaging and easy to follow, which is yeah. usually some of the key barriers that stop people from engaging with stuff. Yeah. And it sounds fascinating, actually, because, I mean, what is the ultimate goal that any organization want to achieve, in your view? What, what is it they want to achieve? Um, it varies. They all have a different North Star, you know. You reckon? It, well, yeah, because success can be, it can be making lots of money. It mm. can be having lots of lots of customers it can be making a difference in the world um, right. now these things are not uncorrelated you know if you you only get a lot of money by having a lot of customers but by having that slight difference does mean you set up your company and your focus and actually it all starts uh whenever i work with a company going well, what is your vision what is your what are your goals how sharp are those have you clearly articulated them because if not let's start there yes because without those You'll have, you'll say, you know, I often go into companies, they say, oh, no, we do have it clear. And I say, okay, well, let me go and test that with your workforce. And you'll find there's all this discrepancy. And you say, what that's causing is person A thinks it's this. So they're off doing this. And person B thinks it's something different and they're off doing this. And although yeah. it might seem like a 1% difference, over time, they will diverge. So no wonder yes. person B will say, oh, no, this is more important. And person A will say, this is more important. So when you present, well, we need to do this, um, you'll get disagreements. So you need that you need to start off very clear. So, so um, I, I, I wouldn't say that every company has a, a common, uh, has the same sort of ambition. Obviously right. there's commonality and overlap in what they want to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what, it's not one size fits all. It all depends on what they're looking to achieve, what their goals are, you know, and what the kind of problems that they're experiencing. Yeah. And, and and be honest about that. I once worked with a company yeah. or I got a client where I walked in and they had um, they had very clear document written down around their vision and their strategy, which was all about making a difference around sustainability, around the environment. 
And I said, great, well, let's have a look at what the work you're actually doing. You know, so I went back and looked at the three years worth of work they were doing, both internal projects and external projects. And I couldn't find anything that mapped to what they said they wanted to achieve. So I presented this to their board and I said, look, either your vision is wrong or you've hmm. been doing all the wrong projects for the last three years. Right. Which is it? You know, and yeah. I said, I don't mind which it is, but it's better to, to be clear. And after we sort of talked for half an hour, I said, the only thing I can see in common is that you want to make more money. You want to make money. Hmm. And one of the directors said, yeah, that is what we want to do. Right. Mm. And someone else said, yeah, yeah. And they and the third person said, it's nice to be able to be honest about it for a change. Instead of yeah. saying, we don't actually care about sustainability. I said, so why did you write that? You know, that's confusing. To, that, that's confusing to you guys. Look at how the relief that you've just all been honest. But also it's, it's confusing to shareholders, to customers. You know, maybe you don't want to be so mercenary and just write, we're here just to make money. But don't pretend it's something completely different because you feel that's the right thing to do. Yeah, I mean, but doesn't, I mean, we live in a capitalist society. Yeah. And I know there are lots of charities, but even charities need to create money, right? So the reason I kind of asked the question about, you know, what's the one single thing that everybody wants? Yeah, I do. I do believe people's center point is like, well, first thing is we need to make money. If we don't make money, we can't pay ourselves. We can't pay our employees or the shareholders. If the shareholders involved, we yeah. can't pay our, off our loans, you know, and that that always seems to be the focus. And, you know, customers and employees seem to always get secondary and personally i feel that money has to happen but if you look after your customers and your employees surprise surprise it may automatically come then you know so so how do you get people to focus on you know rather than kind of go yeah we just want to make money well look after your employees who then will look after your customers and then the result will be more money, more income. So I think what you've articulated there for me is the difference between a vision and a strategy. So a vision is where do you want to end up? You know, yeah. and, and, and say you are a charity. Let's take the charity example. We want to end up helping this group of individuals, as many of them as possible. So then I say, okay, well, the strategy is how are you going to get there? Mm. Now, the strategies can change over time. But your vision shouldn't change. That's what you want to achieve. You want to help these people. Now, you might say, look, to, to, to do that, we need to build up a pool of money so we can spend it helping you know, refugees, helping children, helping whatever. Yes. So the first strategy is build up that pool of money. Yeah. Right. And then once we've reached a point, we'll switch that strategy out or we'll have a strategy alongside it that says use that money. Right. All right. So strategies come and go, and, and the good thing about strategies is we, people build strategies based on their belief of what they think and hopefully based on fact, but they yeah. don't always work out. That's why strategies come and go, because you, okay. I always tell companies to test and learn. So adopt a strategy, try it, review it, reflect, be honest whether it's worked or not, and if it hasn't, substitute it with your next strategy. Right. Right. So it may be that you achieve by getting your employees happy and your customers happy. All right. Yeah. Go and try that. Give it your best efforts. Do all the things to do that. If it doesn't work or it doesn't work to, as well as you hope to review it and change something about it. Right. So that's the way to do it, because because I'll I'll work with companies and they'll all have a different way. That they think they can achieve their thing. Now, I you know, I will always push them to lead by fact. Okay, where's the evidence that this A will be better than B? But ultimately, it'll be like, right, if you think A, let's try A, but let's let's set ourselves at six months, let's review it honestly, and then we and then we either double down on that strategy or we move on to a different one. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, hundred. Yeah, I get that. But it's amazing. A lot of people set their strategy, but they never review it. No, they never review it honestly. Mm. Uh, and that just seems really strange to me. 
right? Why would you continue doing something if it wasn't producing a fee? You probably do it out of comfort and it's safe and it's because you don't want to change. And because, mm. But if it's honestly not driving you closer to where you want to be, then it's not the right strategy for you. Definition of insanity, isn't it? Definition yeah. of insanity. Not that I'd ever say that to a client, but yes. No. <laughs> <laughs> doing the same things over and over and expecting a different result. Yeah. yeah. What? Okay, great. And um, presumably you use different tools and techniques to help people. Can you share a little bit about that? Of course, yeah. And this is where my, my previous career has come in incredibly handy. So I actually use a lot of techniques that I learned as a school teacher uh, right. with, with businesses and senior professionals. Um, I do have a methodology um, that I go use for companies. And it's basically, it's an equation that says success is built up of three factors, IQ, EQ, and FQ. Now, IQ is the ability to come up with great ideas. So do you have enough of them in your company? Are they robust? Are they based on fact? Um, you know, are they the best ideas? The second one is EQ. Are you able to sell those ideas to others, bring them along with you? And the third is, can you then focus on delivering those ideas? Right. And you need all three. You cannot rely on just one or two of those, right? Because imagine you have re really smart people in your company, but nobody, they can't articulate it to anyone. Mm. Right? Then, then, then the smart idea goes nowhere. Or say you've got really smart ideas, you've got everyone bought in, but the company's trying to do a hundred things and they just don't have the bandwidth to do that. Yeah. And it's not going to go in. So, so this is the kind of overarching. Now within that, I use some techniques, as I said, to either improve the IQ, either improve the EQ or improve the FQ. Um, and those can be a range of uh, techniques and activities uh, from, from actually facilitating myself, the groups, or yeah. teach how to apply it around their company. So does that kind of make sense at a yeah. broad level? I mean, yeah. I can obviously IQ, give some EQ example. and FQ. FQ um, yeah. And do you, how do you measure that then? Do you go in and measure that in some way through surveys or questionnaires? Or how will you know where the people are with their IQ, EQ, FQ? So I will often engage the the uh, the clients and ask their opinion um to get a thing because here's the here's the here's the thing right um in reality companies could probably do with improvements across all three dimensions mm. so it's about where you're going to focus your efforts where's the biggest bang so it's a combination of where do they believe um but also my observations so so i'll give you for example um a time when I sort of applied uh, my um, review. So I once worked with a company uh, and this was actually going back, this was before I set up my own company and I was seconded in as a, as a commercial director. And yeah. my remit was to try and find an extra hundred million uh, pounds worth of sales for the wow. company, which was uh, quite a challenge considering the company had only made about 70 million the year before. So it was more than doubling. Well. And my boss, the uh, MD, gave me two weeks to come up with an initial plan. And after a week, she pulled me into a room and said, look, I need to know the answer now. Oh what, are you, what, where are you, what are you leaning towards? And I said, look, two weeks. I said, look, I don't have a firm plan, but I tell you one thing we need to do immediately. She said, what's that? I said, we need to teach everyone in this company how to run meetings. And she looked at me strange and said, why should we do that? And I said, have you ever been to a meeting in this company? Right. People turn up five, 10 minutes late. Nobody, there's no agenda. So nobody knows what they're really talking about. Everyone just has a nice conversation, sat on a bean bag with a cup of coffee. The meeting invariably overruns. There's no actions. There's no follow-ups. And people then just go to the next meeting. And I said, not only is it unproductive, it's demoralizing. It stops people from actually organizing meetings, you know, and, and, and it just means everything is a nice chat and we don't actually get stuff done. And so she said, okay, yeah, that resonates with me. I, 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 so, okay, go ahead and teach these people. So we, we rolled out a six-week course in how to run meetings. And you know what happened? Sales improved by over 2%. My Just, God. <laughs> so, she, you know, you wouldn't have thought of that as a natural place, but by having a bit more FQ, as I call it there, a bit more focus and structure, it allowed for other good things to flow. Now, I could have, you know, it's hard to sometimes go in with a clipboard and say, 
this will deliver this. And I didn't know it would lead to that increase in no. sales. But I did see there was a giant warning light going off saying, look, this, there is a massive lack of FQ here. Um, fix that and we'll see what you know, good will definitely come from it. Now, I probably could have picked something else, maybe in the mm. EQ, maybe the way people have conversations. I, I could have easily said, look, do you know what? People in this environment don't, um, they, um, they close down each other. They, they don't, um, they don't uh, construct it. They're not constructive in their feedback. They're very dismissive. And let's teach people how to give feedback more effectively. And I'm sure that would have had a knock-on effect. Yeah. But the one that was just most obvious immediately when I walked in was around the meetings. So that's, that's when I say that often actually you could, you could, you could apply your shoulder in, in lots of, against lots of those different pillars. Or actually a lot of my clients come already going, I think it's this arena. Can you help us with that? And yeah. I'd rather work on something that they're already sort of chomping at the bit to do than yes. spend hours going, actually, do you know what? You really need to focus on this and, and waste a month debating with them. Right, right. I'll tell you a little story. I, I worked for a, I, was, I wasn't a multinational, but it was a national textile group in Leicester. Yeah. And we unfortunately had inherited an Australian businessman as CEO. He, he, he was not a nice man. However, he put in place some very, very good things. One thing was about meetings. If he was in a meeting that he was chairing and you arrived late, you could not join the meeting anymore. <laughs> it's true. You kind of, he, he said, goodbye, mate. <laughs> you know, you're late. Guess what? He, that guy never turned up late for meetings again. Yeah. It, yeah. it just worked. It was just really simple. You're either on time or you're late. And if you're late, you can't come in the meeting. Yeah. Um, You'll get the minutes, you know, but yeah. your voice isn't heard. Yeah. Uh, and it worked. It really worked. Oh, I'm not surprised. Yeah. Often, you so said this is a combination of a couple of things that I often uh, try and implement in, in companies. One is have clear, um, have clear rules or have clear decisions. Don't half, yes. I always say don't half decide because when you leave gray area, then that's where things, so it's very, and then the other thing is people learn. So when I run training courses, I have a strong belief that people learn through failure. Yes. Okay? They're more in tune to actually pay attention if they've learned. So if they failed, so the person who turned up late learned a very harsh lesson and changed their behaviors. Whereas yes. if they turned up late, but they've been allowed in, they probably wouldn't have changed their behavior because no. there wasn't a consequence. Uh, so often when I try and instruct to change, I'll often engineer a failure early on to create a shock to the system so that people yeah. are more open to change. Um, um, yeah. And so, you know, there's a lot of good stuff. And do you know what? I, I love that story because I do a lot of wacky stuff with companies and often they think, it, why are you doing this? You know, I've run meetings where pe if people turn up late, they're not allowed in or, you can only talk if you're holding an item or you can only talk if you're holding a plank. Have you ever done a, you know, a plank exercise? Yes. Right? It's a great one. If you've got a group where um, people are talking too much with no real, they're just sort of, they're just having a monologue without yes. actually getting to a point. Um, and that can be quite drastic. It's a bit of a laugh, but it really emphasizes. Yeah. What am I trying to say? What is the point of my communication? Uh, oh. what is the meeting? Yeah, there's, I don't know if you've, um, I, I, this is totally off topic, but we might as well share it. Yeah, that's um, good. There's a, there's a new revolution going on in social media. It's called social audio. Yeah. Like Clubhouse were probably the, the pioneers. Now you've got Twitter spaces. LinkedIn are going to roll out LinkedIn audio to the creators. Hopefully one day I'll get it. Um, and I've listened to many audio meetings like you know these social audio meetings and they're fantastic you, you can learn some amazing stuff from people but oh my god people are not holding planks that's for sure they just go on and on and on and when they get the mic you cannot shut them up so you know i make a prediction all of these i think one of them already does it it's a it's a platform called wisdom they already have a counter where anybody that speaks apart from the two hosts 
if somebody comes in and wants to make a point, they've only got so many seconds to make their point. And after that, they're just cut off automatically. Mm. And and so anyway, yeah, that's the equivalent of holding a plank, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and yeah, that's I mean, that's a big focus, uh, improving your communication. Um, it was something that was drummed into me as a strategy consultant very early on. You know, imagine right. imagine you have to pay a thousand pounds or a thousand dollars per word you use on a document. You'll start oh. using a lot less words. Um, <laughs> right? Because um, oh. sometimes we just add, you know, it's the old Mark Twain quote. I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short one. It's actually yeah. more skilled to write a short communication than a long. Yes, I like that. Love it. Um, I wonder if you could do me a favor because yes. I understand IQ. Yes. Ideas. I understand FQ focus. Yeah. The hardest one for me to get my head around a bit more, although I've heard you what you said. Yeah. Could you go in a little bit more depth EQ? Because for me, that seems to be the most grayish area to me. It, it is. It, it can be a gray, a gray area. And some people, for some people, it's more natural than others, but it can be it can be taught. Now, and everything I do is at a company level, but also an individual level. Let's talk at the individual level to bring this to life. Now, yeah. EQ is someone who's got great EQ is someone who's really good at um, being a people person. You know, think about your the people you've met in your group of friends or your work. There is usually one or two people who just seems to galvanize people, seems to be in tune. Now, that for me is EQ. And I talked about when I set up the equation, I said it's about the ability to take others with you. Yeah. Now, at the heart of it is being able to flex your style. OK, right. Is being able to see are my words and what I'm doing now being effective on Michael? If not. I need to adapt and meet what Michael needs. Right. Okay. Now, this could be you go into a meeting and you realize that the other person loves numbers, loves facts and figures. Right. So the best way to communicate that person is bring in lots of facts and figures, bring in a spreadsheet, mm. show them the numbers. Right. But you might be in a meeting straight after to talk about the same topic with someone else who hates spreadsheets. Yeah. They're a big picture thinker. They love pictures. They love talking. They actually don't want to see any document. So the onus is on you to to flex, to be to communicate in the way they want. Right. And yeah. people give clues around how they like to be communicated. They give it in the way they talk, the way they interact with you. You know, it's, people often say to me um, on an email, should I start the day? Should I start with how are you? How was your weekend? Or should I get straight to the point? I said, it really depends on the other person. Right. Some people yeah. hate it when you you write because they're like they're to the point And they're like, why are they asking me about my day? I couldn't care less about their day. Um, but someone else will be offended if you don't write. How was your day? And I said, the clue is look at their emails. How do they start to you? You yeah. mirror them. Right. So it's small things like that about being, um, you know, and how can so understand people around you better find connections. There's a simple fact that when human beings find something in common with each other, they are more mm. likely to have a productive relationship. OK, so any meeting I run or any team event, I will start off with a little bit of a, an activity where people find out about each other. And it doesn't have to take long and it doesn't have to be onerous. But it's amazing how powerful Let me, you know, I'll tell you a story about a, a client I'm working with where they were a bunch of individuals. They weren't a team because they were right. They were all, they were all alpha individuals who were hired to do specific roles that they were very good at. Yeah, but it just so happens that their performance went down as a team because during the pandemic, because they were no longer co-located. So they could no longer ask each other questions, which they did, which they didn't realize was actually part of teamwork. Right. So what I needed to do was, is, it was get them to be a team, but mm. because they were alpha type people, they had no interest. So, you know, one person had no interest in learning anything about the person next to them. I was fascinated. I remember asking someone early on, I always, get, I always have a one-on-one -on -one, and I said to the person, do you know anything about the person who sits next to you? Do you know, uh, you know, do they, you know, if they have children, do they have, and he said, no, I don't, I don't know. I said, how long have you been sat next to him? He said about 10 years. I said, wow, wow. wow you don't care. That's so, incredible. It's incredible. So not only did he not know, he didn't care. So I had to find a way for them to care without realizing. So I'd use these sort of icebreakers and energizers at the start of the game and made them competitive. So they thought it was all about the competition, but actually yeah. it was about learning about each other. Yeah. 
So within six months, they actually started to know about each other. They started to ask about each other's families. They started to know how the other person liked, whether they liked mornings or nights, whether they liked emails or phone calls. Mm. And you know what happened? Their performance began to improve as a team. They began making more money than they'd ever made. Mm. Now, this wasn't a coincidence, right? This is because we were increasing the, the levels of EQ in the team. Yeah. But I had to do it on the, uh, on the sly, whereas other teams, they want to actually know and they're invested and that's easier. But that's, yeah. that's what it is, right? So improve the EQ and you will go much further together than being alone. Thank you very much. That really is a wonderful explanation of how, and, and I love that story. I mean, I find it incredible. I mean, there's a, you might be interested in actually listening to a podcast I did with a guy in America called Ron Stickler. Yeah. And he's written a book. He's, he's in his seventies and he's lost his voice. So talk about being determined to be on podcast he uses a voice re recorder thing that speaks yeah. for him on yeah, podcasts wow. wow um it was a challenge to produce it but we did it and he does many of them regularly and he ha he's written a book called prosperity personality recognition and he has just four categories I, I know there's all these different tests available but i'd never heard about this one in particular and he has got, um, let me think now, he's got like drivers, analytical analysts, craftsmen, and persuaders. And immediately, I, I've read his book, I've been learning about this, but also when you talked about this guy who didn't know anything about his neighbor that he sat next to for 10 years, and he didn't care, which is the other thing, <laughs> To me, he was a driver because that's exactly the personality of a driver. He's just driven to do certain things his way for himself. He doesn't really care about people around him that much. Mm, mm. Now, it doesn't mean that he doesn't doesn't deep down care about a fellow human co-worker, but it's just his makeup or her makeup is that they're just driven in a certain direction. So, yeah, I mean, it's so important. Relationships... I'm so fortunate because I have lots of guests that talk about the human condition and relationships and how mm. we got a empathy. My last podcast guest was all about empathy for each other. You know, we, we just don't have that anymore. The, the division that's occurring in the world as well. So I'm so pleased that you're out there trying to get people to change just in a little bit you know, to kind of recognize and the, the EQ sounds an amazing tool to do that. Yeah. I mean, my vision is to make, you know, a small part of the world a little bit more effective um, mm. than it was the day before. And that includes myself. And if that's helping with EQ or helping with focus or helping with ideas, then that's a great place to be. You know, a place where I think you should definitely be, or and I'm, I'm not meaning this to be a political discussion, but you should be in Downing Street. <laughs> <laughs> you should get those people being able to work together with each other. Oh, incredible. They have some problems, major problems. Well, well, dream big. Who knows? In a year from now, Michael, we'll, we'll do another podcast and we'll, uh, maybe we'll do it from Downing Street. Well, I would love that. I would love that. Yeah. Anybody listening, please refer <laughs> Farris to Downing Street. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Faris, is there anything that I haven't asked that you haven't shared yet that you would like to share before you share where people can find you? Hey, uh, Michael, I am fully confident we could speak for another like two hours and cover many more exciting topics. Um, so it, now it's been a real pleasure. Yeah, uh, you know, I always say let's just carry on the conversation. Me and you, me and your listeners, uh, you and your listeners uh and um then then yeah the more people that are talking the better as far as i'm concerned i'll tell you what we'll do is i have an idea for you um when i get linkedin audio social audio yeah right, you're on linkedin aren't you i am yeah let's let's and and for the listeners you know keep in touch with us if you're up for it We'll, we'll do a, like a live social audio 
thing inside LinkedIn. We'll get some people to come and listen and we can have a little bit of a discussion with people and find out what some of their issues are, because these are all business people. I'm sure they have lots of these kind of challenges and we could just give them a little snippet of the kind of things they could do uh, for themselves. I'd so where can, thank you. Where could people find you? How can they well, get in touch with you? Well, they can find me on LinkedIn if they look up Faris Aranki. Uh, I spend a lot of time there, so you can interact with me. Or you can come and find all about me and my company at my company, which is called Sheer Ghetto. Um, and the website is www.sheerghetto.com. And Sheer Ghetto is S-H-I-A-G-E-T-O. It's uh, for all the uh, Japanese enthusiasts out there. It's the Japanese word for a sharpening stone because... That's a metaphor for what me and my business do. We sharpen other businesses. I love that. And how? tell us how the name came about. It came about because I was looking for a company name and uh, lots of the English ideas I came up with had already gone in terms of websites and, and were registered. And so I decided to switch languages and I tried names in Arabic and Spanish. And yes. I remember testing them on some friends and particularly the Arabic ones, uh, I got some honest feedback that the name sounded a bit terroristy uh, in their right. own words, which, which is is the kind of harsh, but the, the feedback you want from your friends. Before yes. you and then one day I was making a salad with a knife that was dull and I yes. reached my sheer ghetto. I didn't know it was called a sheer ghetto at the time to sharpen my knife. And suddenly I had this light bulb moment. I said, hang on a minute. This is a metaphor for my company. Let's research what the Japanese word for a sharpening stone is. Wow. And uh, Eureka. But why were you looking for a Japanese word? Just because, because you wanted a different language? No, no. I was using a Jap I had a Japanese set of knives and a Japanese stone. Um, and I knew the Japanese took it very seriously. And actually, I, I spent four hours researching because the Japanese have six different names for sharpening stones, depending on their uh, granularity and what they're used for. So this is how passionate the Japanese are. So I thought I would embrace that passion and pick the finest stone, which is the sheer ghetto. Sheer ghetto. I love that. That's brilliant. Okay, well, I'll make sure to share all of those details in the show notes so people can find you all across social and uh, your website as well. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I loved it. Thank you for having me, Michael. Take care. I'll be in touch. All the best. Bye for now. If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.